Hello everyone, my name is Preston Dennett, and thank you for joining me for another new episode of UFOs and the Paranormal. I've got a pretty interesting set of UFO encounters I'd like to present to you today. I call this episode, 10 Unusual Extraterrestrial Encounters. I think UFO encounters by their very nature are unusual, but the 10 I've collected today are particularly unusual. The ETs behave in ways that we don't often see. And that's what I wanted to kind of highlight in today's little collection. As usual, I do have cases from all over the world, cases from over a number of different decades going through time, cases involving all different types of humanoids, cases with all kinds of evidence, such as landing traces, animal reactions, electromagnetic interference, and these kinds of things. Uh, the cases I have today are from the United States, uh, South America, Europe, uh, Australia as well. So yeah, some really interesting cases that are just a bit off the beaten path. And I hope you find them interesting. Certainly I found them interesting and that's why I chose them. It's going to be about an hour-long episode, I estimate, so let's just get started. And the first case I want to talk about today, I call, If There Are Any More Wars. This occurred on August 30, 1955, in Mulberry Corners, Ohio. And yeah, this is a very unusual and little-known case involving direct contact a landed UFO, humanoids, and a very interesting message from the ETs. The main witness in this case is a gentleman by the name of David Ankenbrat. He was only 21 years old when he had a very unusual encounter. Now, this case was investigated by Alan Roosh of the UFO Research Council of Cleveland. And that organization has been in operation for quite a long time. It was about 1.40 a.m. on August 30, 1955, as David drove along Chardon Road, Route 6, this is about three miles east of Willoughby Hills, when he saw a bright yellow light drop from the sky to his right. He thought it might have been a meteor, and he stopped his car to investigate. And as he walked out into the field, he was shocked not to find a meteor, but some kind of aircraft about 30 feet in diameter with a dome on top. Now, naturally, this frightened him a little bit and he turned and started to run towards his car, at which moment a, quote, green light bolted out in front of me. So he turned around to see where this light had come from and found himself unable to move. And as he watched, a door opened in this flying saucer, and a man emerged, walked up, and approached David face to face. And per David, this man was more than six feet tall and clad in, quote, something like a ski suit. And the man began to speak to him. This man spoke in a high-pitched voice, saying, quote, do not be afraid. And then he had a very unusual message. The man told David that they wanted him to inform the government in Washington, D.C. that, quote, if there were any more wars here, we will have to take over. Now, at this point, David protested and said that, quote, a kid like myself would never be taken seriously. But this strange man insisted and said that David had only one week to deliver this message. This strange man then turned around and returned into the craft. David was now released from his paralysis. This craft was apparently still there, but frightened, David turned and ran back to his car and fled the area without seeing the UFO take off. Now, no, no surprise, David did not deliver this message to the government in Washington, D.C. But two days later, at the same location, David again encountered the UFO, and apparently the same humanoid, who repeated the same message, that David needed to tell the leaders in Washington the message that they gave him. So again, David fled the area, and this time he did tell his mother. And about three days later, he took a friend to the same location, 
in search of evidence, but they didn't find anything. Now David's mother, hearing about this, did some research and found the UFO Research Council of Cleveland, and this case was investigated. In fact, in late October, investigators from that UFO group checked the site for any landing marks or radioactivity, but unfortunately, they found nothing. But this case did get some attention from government, actually, because it was 10 months after the encounter that Project Blue Book officially investigated the case. And I'll put that word investigated in quotes because they didn't actually talk to the witness at all, but spoke to only his mother and then labeled the case as, quote, psychological. Apparently, they did not relay the message to Washington. And wars on our planet continued. No surprise, David Ankenbrandt's family and his friends disagreed with Blue Book's conclusion, added, as did the UFORC. And in fact, they invited David to a UFO convention in Cleveland in December of 1955, but David declined. He didn't want any publicity and he didn't want to talk about his encounter. So that is certainly a very interesting case, which deserves to be more well known. The ETs apparently did not follow through with their promise, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, also, it's unfortunate that the witness elected not to speak any more about it, but I totally understand. At least he did come forward, allow his case to be researched, and it doesn't surprise me that he doesn't want to talk about it anymore because most witnesses don't talk about it publicly, that is, at all. So I have to give kudos to him for at least coming forth. And now we move on to the next case, which is so unusual, not only in how the ETs behaved, but what they looked like. I mean, the whole encounter is really strange. I like this case because it involves animal reactions. It's quite a lengthy and interactive encounter and just unusual on a number of different levels. I call this one the aliens in the cornfield. Some of you may have heard about this one. It was new to me, uh, so I think you'll find it super interesting. This one occurred on September 25, 1957, in the very small town of o Alliance, Ohio. This very unusual case has not received really much coverage at all, but it's quite interesting. It was originally researched by David Webb, a pioneering researcher, there are two witnesses, Mr. and Mrs. Alig, and it was late evening when Miss Alig noticed a large luminous sphere of light coming from the direction of nearby Berlin Lake to the northeast, and this object began to hover overhead. She immediately called out to her husband, Sam, and he, of course, also saw the light, and he could see that this was very unusual. He was concerned. He immediately told his wife to take their two-year-old daughter and herself and hide under the bed. He then turned out all the lights in the house. At this point, the object moved closer to the house and then stopped about 1,000 feet above the cornfield across the road from the front of their house. At this point, this object was only about 275 feet away, they estimate. This object was sort of pancake-shaped, but thicker in the middle, so pretty much your typical flying saucer, though it was standing on edge. And as Sam watched, this object dropped in a yo-yo fashion until it was only about 20 feet above the cornfield. And at this point, it seemed to fade out and disappear. But Sam wasn't convinced it was gone. He kept his eye on the area where this object had been, and sure enough, after about 10 minutes, he saw a group of 11 or 12 humanoid figures. And they were quite large, quite tall. He estimates that they were each about 7 feet tall and very broad-shouldered. Sam knew this because they rose above the corn, which at that time was about 5 to 6 feet tall. Each of the figures was wearing the same type of tight-fitting gray diver's suit. And as Sam watched, these figures moved through the cornfield towards him. At this point, Sam considered getting his wife and child and fleeing the area. 
But the problem was, his car was parked at the end of his driveway, right near the cornfield, and by this time, the figures had exited the cornfield and were standing in one long row at the edge of the cornfield, all of them facing his house, and one of the figures had started to cross the street and was now starting to move towards Sam's driveway. So he decided it was too late to go to the car, and he rushed around in the house and grabbed his 16-gauge shotgun, but couldn't find the shells to load it. He asked his wife where the shells were, and she informed him that they were actually outside in the garage. But by this time, this figure was approaching and walking up the driveway itself and was in fact only a few feet from the porch. So Sam was not willing to go outside at this point and really had no choice but to stand there and watch from the window. Now, at this point, their dog, Danny Boy, who was normally very friendly to strangers, lifted his head and, as Sam says, emitted a, quote, a low, throaty growl that seemed to come from the back of its tail. Then the dog laid its head down on its paws, and meanwhile this seven-foot-tall humanoid walked right by the house, literally only feet away, right under the covered patio, and went behind the house. Now Sam remained where he was, looking out of this big picture window at the front of the house, because there was still this long row of humanoids, uh, very close, all of them facing him. Now, at this point, both Sam and his wife heard, quote, very heavy breathing coming from the, behind the house. It sounded to them like this creature was having labored breathing, having trouble breathing. But shortly then, they, found, they heard this sound of shuffling feet. So, following this sound, they could hear that this creature, this being, was returning back towards the front of the house. So Sam looked out of the screen door to get a better look, and he did. He got a nice close look at this figure and confirmed that, yes, its entire body was covered from head to toe by this skin-tight gray jumpsuit, except for its face. Now, he couldn't really see the face. Now, as this being walked by Danny Boy, the dog, it growled again, but the creature paid no attention to the dog. This figure then walked back down the driveway, rejoined the other figures in this long row, and like all of them, turned and faced the house. Moments later, all in unison, all 11 beings turned around and went back into the cornfield and disappeared into the darkness. Now, at this point, Sam's wife and his child came out from under the bed. They had hid under there, they estimate, for about 20 minutes or so. Sam himself stayed up the rest of the night watching this cornfield until sunrise, but saw nothing. But he did notice one odd thing. During this whole time, no cars at all passed along the road. So how crazy is that case? <laughs> all the ETs just lining up in a row like that? one approaching so close, the dog reacting the way it did. There's just a lot of interesting elements to it. One thing I did notice that the witness mentioned, that there were no cars passing by. That does seem to turn up in a number of these cases. So there's something to that, I think, for sure. But I'm glad this case was professionally investigated by Walter Webb, a very good, I think, and well-respected researcher and it's a case that deserves more attention. And now we move to another case which I find super fascinating, mostly because of its location. I call this one an alien in the Antarctic. I don't know that I've ever covered another case involving a landed UFO and a humanoid in the Antarctic, so that in itself is unique and super interesting. This one occurred on December 11, 1958, at McMurdo Sound Base in Antarctica. And I like this case also not only because of its location, but because the witness himself is very credible and a trained observer, a military officer. 
Just a super unusual and fascinating case. This next case comes from researcher Ivan S. Durfield, who actually published the account in Ideal UFO Magazine, issue number two. And the main witness in this case is a Navy officer by the name of Roger D. Benson. He was 30 years old at the time, stationed at the McMurdo base in the shadow of Mount Erebus. Now, Roger D. Benson was an AQ-1, or an Aviation Fire Control Technician Petty Officer. And part of his, his duties while stationed at McMurdo Sound Base was included transporting waste. And on December 11, 1958, which was a warm day for this area at about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, Roger was driving a 111 Weasel track vehicle transporting waste. And this is when he noticed a strange object off in the distance. And I'll just quote the Navy officer, Roger D. Benson, directly. As he says in his own words, there shouldn't be anything there. I was curious. I radioed that I was getting out of my vehicle, jumped out onto the ice, and took a closer look. At first I thought I was looking at some object made up of girders, like a tower observation or a gigantic radar antenna. I looked through the binoculars. I was seeing what resembled a side view of an airplane fuselage and the beams were a network of support structures, like a gear train landing. The quote fuselage was a cigar-shaped metal capsule with a small indentation that could have been a door. This whole thing seemed to be about 500 yards from me, which would make, it the, which would make the object the same size as a DC Airplane 3. Although I am completely familiar with aircraft, this was not any plane that belonged to us or the Russians. Then I saw the creature. So at this point, the strange craft was parked on the ice itself with what looked like large landing legs. And this creature that Roger Benson saw was walking beneath the craft. It was walking in slow circles around the base of the craft. And Roger at this point could clearly see that it was not normal, it was not human. Because, as Roger says, again, in his own words, the being was very thin and grayish in color. Its arms were swinging as it walked on the ice. From a distance, I couldn't be sure, but it seemed to have human-like facial features, except that the face consumed almost two-thirds of its body at full height. I'm ashamed to say now that I did exactly what I shouldn't have, contrary to the training I received. I panicked. I climbed into my vehicle, went back to the base, and screamed into the radio. After a few seconds, I controlled myself to look back. The fuselage capsule, minus the beam-shaped landing gear, which could have been retracted, was now rising into the air. I stopped long enough to see the thing fly away, presumably with that strange creature inside. So, now that this craft and being were gone, Roger, apparently afraid of ridicule and disbelief, did not report his sighting to his superiors. He did, however, learn that his second panicked radio transmission was never received. He later did tell his friends about what he saw, and later, of course, spoke to researcher Ivan Durfield. And as it turns out, a lot of sightings were occurring in this area at that time, because as Ivan Durfield writes, as Operation Deep Freeze spread across the Antarctic in 1957 to 1958, radar trackings of UFOs became almost commonplace. And in fact, PHI Stephen B. Bugs, a member of Deep Freeze, wrote, quote, We were getting radar trackings, which were confirmed by operators at three or four different locations on the air and ground. There was absolutely no doubt that real UFOs were observed regularly and frequently. And in fact, it was only two months earlier that Dr. Yuri I. Danikov, a leading Russian glacier expert stationed at Vostok, 
near the South Geometric Pole, wrote that he and his fellow scientists were, quote, pestered by a low flying disk. And as Danikov says in his own words, it was like a flat stone, but apparently made of steel, and it moved in total silence. It flew over us and then made another pass at lower altitude. We had an eerie feeling, not only that we were being watched, but that some force was attempting to communicate with us. I remember a stirring in my mind. I'm absolutely convinced that this was a voyager from the cosmos. So Danikov is clearly trying to describe some sort of telepathic communication. Now, Operation Deep Freeze, which Roger D. Benson was a part of, was led by U.S. Rear Admiral George J. Dufek, who, later in an interview, said, quote, I believe in UFOs. I think that the existence of flying saucers cannot be discounted. Reports of meteors probably were saucers driven from Venus or other planets by intelligent beings. So there you go. Apparently not an isolated incident, but one of a series of events going on at that time with enough activity to convince a lot of high-level military officials. It's surprising to me that this whole subject isn't taken more seriously to this day because what that is, gosh, 50, 60, 70 years ago almost, and it was, it's still not being taken as seriously, the subject, as it should be, in my opinion. How many cases is it going to take before we just embrace the fact that we are not alone? And here is another case, which is equally fascinating. Probably you haven't heard of this one. It's not very well known at all. Though it was uh, researched by a UFO researcher, so it's not just pure hearsay. I call this one the giant on the beach. This occurred in September of 1961 near Brooklyn, New York. And this is again a super fascinating case, not only because of the very unusual appearance and description of the humanoid, but also the way the humanoid behaved. This very and unusual case comes from early pioneering researcher Gray Barker, author of the popular UFO book, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, and editor of the Saucerian Bulletin, where this account appeared. Gray Barker interviewed the main witness, a gentleman by the name of Stan Subin, who had had a bizarre experience with a strange humanoid on the beach at Jacob Reese Park near Fort Tilden outside of Brooklyn, New York, as you can see here. And I'll just quote the main witness, Stan, directly because he describes his experience in excellent and vivid detail. As Stan says in his own words, At that time, I was studying for my PhD in audiovisual education. I usually studied until about 1 or 2 a.m. Afterward, I would usually take a walk on the boardwalk to relax. I usually drove to Reese Park and walked on the boardwalk. On the second week of September of 1961, I was walking on the boardwalk about 2.30 a.m. when I saw a fire on the beach. Above the fire, a sphere of white light hung suspended, about a foot in diameter. Near the water, I could see about five or six skin divers. I could see the black wetsuits with the white strings drawn at their arms. They were all about six feet six inches tall and well built. I was about 50 yards from the fire and was going to approach the skin divers. Then a figure approached the fire and appeared as if it would approach the skin divers from the direction of the water. It came up to the fire and bent over it. It remained in that position for about 30 seconds. I decided not to approach the fire until I could determine what this person was doing. He walked around the fire several times, then stopped and took off what appeared to be sweatpants. What then terrified me was the appearance of this figure. He was white as snow, seven to seven and a half feet tall, and had no distinguishable facial features. I couldn't believe my eyes 
but stared at him in fascination and terror. At this time, I took refuge behind a concrete block, which was about seven feet high. After looking at the creature for several minutes, I knew that he, or it, was not of this world. He walked with an animated gait, like a football player. I was impressed with the massive power it seemed to have within itself. As you can see from the drawing, I am no artist, but this is as good a picture I can make of the creature. I do not believe the person was human. So yeah, a very unusual encounter, and I have to wonder if the skin divers themselves were not human either, with all of them being six feet six inches tall. That seems pretty unusual. Such an interesting case. Yes, it is a single witness case, and there's no real supporting physical evidence or corroborating witnesses, but the details the witness does describe do turn up in case after case. And it's amazing to me because these humanoids are often so similar in some ways and different in others. There was a study done that over 60% of humanoids are four feet tall or under. Then there are these guys who are very, very tall. It's so unusual, very hard to categorize. And now we move to another case, which is well known certainly in the country of Brazil. But I think outside of Brazil, a lot of people haven't heard of this. It's very well authenticated with landing traces apparently and at least three witnesses. So that makes it very important, but it was very thoroughly researched as well. I call this one Aliens in the Backyard. This occurred on August 28, 1963 at Belo Horizonte, Brazil. And what's super interesting about this case is because this is one of the most unusual descriptions of ETs I've certainly heard of. And it appears to be accurate because we have three witnesses who saw this, these very unusual humanoids very, very close up. So there's very little chance of misperception here. Yes, they were children, but still it was a pretty extensive encounter. And not only did the ETs look very unusual, they behaved in very strange ways, as we shall see. Again, this has got to be one of the most unusual humanoid reports on record. And again, it's definitely one of Brazil's most famous and very well authenticated. It was originally published in the Brazilian UFO publication, the SBEDV Bulletin, and was thoroughly investigated by well-known Brazilian researchers Dr. Walter K. Bueller and Holvio Brandt Alexo, among others. The witnesses in this case are the two Sagrada brothers, Fernando, age 12, and Ronaldo, age 9, and their friend Jose Gualberto, age 9. It was after dinner on the evening of August 28, 1963, that the three boys were sent to do a chore in the backyard. They were to gather some water from the cistern so they could wash the coffee strainer. Now it was a moonlit night, but as they stepped outside, they all noticed it was unusually bright in the backyard, but didn't pay too much attention to it at first. And it was Jose who bent down into the cistern to collect water in a bowl. And to do that, he literally had to pretty much put his whole front section of his body down into this cistern to gather the water. So he didn't see what was happening when Ronaldo was the first, age nine, to see a very large spherical shaped craft floating directly above their avocado tree, only about 25 feet away. Now this object was very low, I mean 15 feet high, and they said it was about as big as a large room. It was transparent, or appeared to be transparent, because they could see inside. This object did have two large antenna on top. The craft itself glowed quite brightly, illuminating the area all around. But inside this craft, they saw four beings who were all sitting on single pedestal stools in a row, all facing forward. All of them were dressed identically in what looked like diving suits, 
which were brown on the torso, white below the waist. Uh, it looked to the witnesses like it was made up of wrinkled leather. These figures also wore black boots and had round transparent helmets on their head. And the witnesses were close enough that they could see that two of these figures were men, bald. In the center were two stools side by side. The rest were sort of in a row. But in the center, one figure was male and the other appeared to be female as the witnesses saw that she did have long blonde hair pulled to the back of her head. They said the man in the back was a little heavier than the others. The man in the very front sat in front of a panel with a computer or TV-like screen, and he appeared to be manipulating this panel. Now here's where it gets weird, because all the figures appeared to have only one very large, dark, round eye. The boys did not notice any nose. This could have been a mask, but that was not their impression. At any rate, Jose was still getting water out of the cistern, he hadn't seen any of the craft or beings at this point, but Ronaldo and Fernando did, and they stared in amazement as two yellow beams of light came from below the craft, and the male figure in the center of this spherical craft descended slowly between these two beams, downward in an upright position. And very quickly he reached the ground, and this figure began to walk, in a weird way, very heavily, very stiffly, directly towards the two young boys and the cistern, with uh, Jose still bending over it. Now, Ronaldo and Fernando were just too stunned to react at first, but when this figure raised his arms towards Jose, apparently trying to pick Jose up, they thought, Fernando lunged forward, grabbed Jose, pulled him out of the cistern, and basically threw him onto the ground to prevent him from being taken by this being. At this point, the figure turned and looked at Fernando and Ronaldo. Both of them wanted to run into the house, and in fact, Ronaldo tried, but he banged his knee and stopped. And at this point, all three boys were standing together watching this figure. And all three of them said that they felt that they were unable to move or to even shout out. Now at this point, this figure is only six feet away, and they could see it quite clearly. He was tall, maybe six to seven feet, and they could see this diver's suit appeared actually to be inflated, kind of like an astronaut suit. They said the skin on this being appeared almost reddish. And at this point, this figure began to make a series of strange hand gestures and spoke in a strange language that they could not understand. Fernando, the oldest, said that when the figure did this, all his fear left him, and he felt unusually very calm. At this point, the figure went to the cistern and actually sat down on the edge of it, facing the witnesses. And they all noticed one unusual detail, is that the figure appeared to have difficulty bending his arms, perhaps because of this stiff sort of astronaut-like suit. But as the figure did this, turned to the cistern and began to sit down on the edge of it, Fernando quickly lunged forward, moved behind the figure, picked up a piece of brick, and got ready to throw it at the figure. And as he later told researchers, I wanted to hit him. Now, the figure apparently noticed or anticipated this because he stood up and very quickly faced Fernando and immediately a beam of yellow light came out of the figure's chest and struck Fernando's hand, causing him to drop the brick. The figure at this point, according to the boys, seemed to laugh and then spoke again with what they described as a thick voice probably meaning low and gravelly, and again began making weird hand gestures. According to the boys, this figure was sort of drawing circles in the air with his fingers in an apparent attempt to communicate. Then he pointed upwards, took both his hands, pressed the palms together, and put them to the side of his head in sort of a sleeping gesture. Then he pointed to the moon, 
and raised his hands several times. The boys thought that he was trying to communicate that they were perhaps planning to fly in that direction. They're really not sure what he was trying to say. But at this point, the man turned and walked back under the craft. And Jose turned to Fernando and asked, will he come back? At which point the figure must have heard this because he turned around and sort of nodded or shook his head, but then continued walking. He bent down and picked up a plant or a leaf out of the flower bed. Then he walked directly beneath the craft, made a hand gesture to the people that were inside the craft. Immediately, the same yellow beams of light came down, levitated him back up into the craft. The craft started to move silently upwards and then towards the east over the house and immediately sort of disappeared in a flash of light, producing a gust of wind. Now the three boys were shocked but now able to move and they immediately ran into the house and told their mother, Maria, now she had to believe them because she herself had noticed a strange flash of light earlier, apparently when this UFO first arrived, but really didn't think much of it until these three boys came running in and said, quote, come and see what a horrible thing it is. Now one of the boys, Jose, he refused to go back outside. In fact, he ran and hid under the bed in fear. So Maria called the boy's father, Alcides, who was away from the house at this time, but not far, and he rushed home, he listened to what the boys had to say, immediately went into the backyard and found, he says, strange triangular-shaped depressions about 1.5 centimeters deep. So news of this encounter spread fast through the town. Many of their neighbors expressed disbelief, some were skeptical. The boys, however, <laughs> were very deeply affected by this. They refused to leave the property, which was absolutely contrary to their normal behavior. Fernando was disappointed and amazed that people were skeptical and said, quote, they don't want to believe because one day they will end up seeing what we saw and then it will be proven that we did not lie. I am telling the truth. Now, thankfully, there was, years later, a follow-up investigation when the boys were adults. Fernando still didn't want to talk about it because he was tired of the ridicule and disbelief that he had suffered from going public, but all three stuck to their story. Ronaldo was working at this point as a jewelry setter. Fernando was a well-respected mechanic Jose was perhaps the most deeply affected because he said going through this encounter made him unafraid of anything and he very fearlessly joined the military. He said the encounter transformed him in other ways. He became a spiritualist and a philanthropist helping to prepare and give food to the poor. So you can certainly find out more information about this case at the website phenomenon.com.br. It's an amazing case. Quite an unusual case. I mean, I don't know that there are a whole lot of cases of alleged one-eyed ETs. And I do wonder if that was a mask they were seeing. I don't know. It's just so bizarre. But certainly, it seems well enough verified that it's worth serious consideration. A lot of cases involving kids. This is probably not as unusual as it might sound because kids are often outside, out there playing and doing what kids do. So kids do comprise a large number of witnesses to UFO encounters. And that's absolutely true in this next case, which I call the Shalin's Odd UFO and Humanoids. Probably mispronounced that city name but this one occurred on January 18, 1967 at Shalins Odd, Denmark. And this is one of Denmark's actually more famous cases. And it does involve three witnesses who, yes, are young children. But given that there were three witnesses, it's clear something very unusual did happen here. But again, we have a very unusual description of ETs, a very unusual description of a UFO craft, and the behavior of the ETs as well is very unusual. 
So these are the bizarre of the bizarre, if you will, of UFO cases. This highly unusual case is apparently pretty well known in Denmark, but virtually unknown outside the country. And again, there are three witnesses, Tej Jensen, his younger sister, age four, and the main witness, Jesper Anderson, who was only seven years old. It occurred along the road from Nikobing, Jaland to Jaland's Odd, near where the witnesses lived. And it was about 4.45 in the afternoon, again on January 18, 1967, as the three young children were walking home, and suddenly they saw this gray, cloudy-like object in the sky up and ahead of them. Now Tej, the older boy, became afraid and he wondered if this was some sort of tornado or water spout or something, but believed it was dangerous to remain, and he grabbed his little sister and they ran home to inform their mother. Now Jesper, however, he had no fear, but he decided it would be a good idea to take cover in a ditch. And he did, and from that vantage point, he watched as this object now transformed itself into a roundish ball with a corona of light and two brilliant beams of light projecting downward at an angle. This object moved around in the sky for just a few minutes as the corona around it faded and Jesper could now see that this object was solid and shaped more like a flying saucer. He said it glowed orange, it had a long kind of rectangular window along one side and this was apparently the source of the two beams of light on the other end of the object were antenna. Below the window was what looked to him like strange symbols that he'd never seen before. And this is so bizarre. On one side, he saw what he believed was an image of a black man. Now, at this point, the object descended, turning at right angles, moving in a strange wobbling pattern, which is often what we do see but it gave Jesper the impression that the pilot was having trouble controlling the craft. But it appeared to be coming in for a landing because he watched three short legs extend from the bottom of the craft as it came down to about three feet above the ground. And just when it looked like it was about to land, it didn't. The three legs retracted almost all the way, not fully. The object then rose, moved to the northwest, and it emitted what looked like little black boxes which fell to the ground. Those were never found, but at the same time, he saw what looked like a sort of squarish gondola or a basket-like device being lowered down from a rigid column or cable from the center bottom of the craft. Moments later, an opening appeared in this object right above the basket, and eight figures, each about three feet tall, came down one by one onto this little basket or gondola. At this point, Jesper was close enough to see that they each had long, thin faces, faces long noses, cropped blonde hair, except for one, who had darker and longer hair. One of the figures, only one, wore a solid blue uniform, but the others also wore a blue uniform, but it had red and white stripes on it. They all had what looked like oxygen tanks strapped to their backs with a hose extended to their mouth, kind of like skin divers. This was Jesper's impression. He said they all also wore a cap and each had a flashlight-like device fixed to their shoulder, which emitted light in both directions. So Jesper watched all of this with absolute surprise as this object began to fly directly towards where he was hiding. Uh, he could see that they were manipulating some kind of device which he likened to a camera or a binoculars. He wasn't sure, but he didn't get a hostile impression from them at all. He said the crew appeared to be very friendly. And in fact, as the object began to move off over a grove of trees, several of them apparently saw Jesper and smiled, smiled at him, raised their hands, and he thinks they were waving goodbye, but they did it in an unusual way. At this point, he was close enough to hear a low thrumming noise, 
and as the object began to move away, seven of the eight figures moved back up into the craft. At this point, this craft changed from orange to purple, and it moved off. Now, Jes Jesper estimates that the entire sighting lasted only about five minutes. He immediately ran home and told his parents, who at first were a little skeptical, but they knew that Jesper wasn't the type to lie. And also, they learned that his two friends confirmed at least the beginning part of the sighting. So they took him seriously. Jesper's father showed him pictures of various aircraft, but none of them matched what Jesper saw. So in a search for answers, Jesper's mother contacted the Scandinavian UFO Information Group, who did an official investigation. Because otherwise, this case would have gone unreported but they were never able to identify what Jesper Anderson saw. It would be awesome if there was a follow-up on that case, because I'm very curious if the witness had further encounters after this. It's an amazing case, I mean, with the ETs waving at this little boy. I'm glad he did have other witnesses, even if they didn't see the whole encounter. And another thing that's interesting about this case is how it very nearly went unrecorded. So it wouldn't surprise me one bit if a lot of other people saw this, but just never told anyone, never talked about it. Again, that's, what, that's how most people react. They just don't talk about it, even to close family members and friends. So I think there's a definite lesson there. <laughs> if you have an encounter, don't be shy to talk about it. All right, moving along. Here's another truly fascinating case, which I call the Aliens in the Window. This occurred on April 18, 1971 in Evans City, Pennsylvania. And this is just a fascinating case of a very close up sighting of a UFO and ETs looking down at the witnesses from the porthole in the craft. It was around dusk on April 18, 1971, as a young engaged couple, known only as Dennis D. and Marion L., drove through Evans City. This is a rural area north of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and they were on their way back home to Marion's house. This is when they noticed a bright white light that seemed to be pacing their car. As they watched, very suddenly, this light abruptly crossed the road from right to left ahead of them, stopped for a second, then crossed back over the road and moved off. They thought it was over, but of course it was just beginning. And curious as to what they had seen, Marion made a point to gaze in that direction where the light had gone. And it's a good thing she did, because as she's Looking, they were passing by this short grass-covered airstrip, which, by the way, was not in use on that night. This was when Marion, very briefly and suddenly, saw an object off in the distance hovering at low level over a field. She said it appeared to be football-shaped, quite large, about 25 to 30 feet in diameter, with a rim of windows around the circumference. Now, the upper half had a concave top, and again, a series of vertically oriented windows. The bottom half had a series of round windows or perhaps lights glowing red. And from the top of the craft came a bright white beam of light shining upwards. And Marion, looking at the upper windows, was amazed to see two humanoid figures. And these were big. She estimates that they were about 10 feet tall. And it was very unusual because they had their arms lifted up over their heads. Now she saw this very briefly and was about to shout out to her fiance, Dennis, to stop the car. But before she could, they passed a hill which obscured her view. So she immediately told him what she had seen and they drove a short distance ahead where there was a little dirt road leading off the highway towards the direction of this object. And they followed this dirt road for about a half mile when suddenly, right through the windshield, they could now see this object hovering over a grassy area, or perhaps landed. It was very, very low. 
and only about 250 feet away. So Dennis pulled off the road, and together this young couple watched with nervous fascination, is how they described it. They said this object was very silent, not moving, glowing with light. At this point, they could no longer see any figures through the windows. But they were absolutely awestruck and stayed there watching this object for about 20 minutes. They thought about trying to find other witnesses, but the only visible house in the area was a farmhouse with all the lights off. It appeared to be unoccupied. Dennis did suggest that they drive closer to the object, but Marion became fearful and told him not to do that. In fact, she wanted to leave and go home. And Dennis reluctantly agreed. They turned around, drove back up the dirt road towards the highway. They looked back several times as they did so, and this UFO remained there in the same location. Now once home, Marion called a cousin of hers who was married to an amateur astronomer and UFO researcher. So they shared their story, and the next day they all returned to the site hoping to find evidence that the craft had been there. Unfortunately, they found nothing. Now, in somewhat confirmation of this incident, it was exactly one week later at 9 p.m., and less than 300 miles away in Pottstown, Pennsylvania, a woman was driving home when she saw a strange object over a farm field, and as she said, it was a very white pulsating light. I stopped my car on the road next to the field and just studied it. I couldn't make out any shape, just the light. I rolled down the window to see if there was an engine sound, but there was none. She then had this feeling that it was, quote, just the light and me, and drove off in fear. She did tell her husband, who returned immediately to the site, but by then the object was gone. So it's impossible to say for sure if this sighting was related to the object seen one week earlier by Dennis and Marion, but who knows, it certainly is possible. A truly fascinating case because they watched this object for a good amount of time from a pretty close distance. You should count yourself lucky if you have a witness with you, like these two did, because a lot of people who see a UFO alone seriously question their own eyes. But this is an amazing encounter. Uh, it's a shame that there wasn't more, or a really any evidence of this craft being there, but I think most cases are like that. They don't leave a whole lot behind, but it's certainly an important case that was professionally researched and doesn't appear to be any type of conventional craft. So many cases. I mean, it's mind-blowing how many cases there are. It's just case after case after case. And here is another one. This one is super interesting. This one I call the alien on the ham radio. This occurred on August 12, 1976 in Cincinnati, Ohio. A couple of Ohio cases here. I like this one because it's so unusual in that, well, as we'll see, there is what we would call electromagnetic interference or disturbance or intervention, however you want to put it. It's super interesting. This case was researched by a professional researcher as well, very experienced researcher. But it's such an unusual case, again, in the appearance of the ETs and how they behaved and just the whole series of events in this encounter. This next case comes pr from prolific researcher Timothy Green Beckley who published this account in his publication, UFO Review. It was nighttime, again on August 12, 1976, as David L. Dobbs drove in his car outside of Cincinnati, Ohio, while listening to his CB radio. And he was on a channel listening to one truck driver giving directions to another truck driver who had apparently become lost and this is when suddenly, for no apparent reason, David's vehicle began to malfunction. His engine began to miss, his headlights flickered, also his CB went out. 
Very quickly, his vehicle and headlights went back to normal, but the CV didn't. It remained off. Uh, so he punched the access code, and this is when suddenly a strange voice came on and said, quote, Priority break, followed by a call number, which strangely he couldn't remember, even after just hearing it. And as David says in his own words, Usually I remember calls, but the odd quality of the voice must have distracted me. It was kind of melodious, deep and compelling, with an accent I couldn't place. I just said, go break, and kept listening. From that point on, the whole incident had a sort of dreamlike quality. The fascinating voice went on to say his vehicle was disabled on Old Route 84, near the quarry, and requested some assistance. So Dobbs knew this location. It was only a few miles away. So he said to stand by, and he would arrive shortly. Now, the road at this time was old and decrepit. It's no longer there. So David had to reduce his speed to about 15 to 20 miles per hour. In fact, the road was so little used, a branch blocked the road ahead of him. He got out to remove it, and this is when David noticed a strange flickering blue light, which he likened to a police car siren, over in the treetops about 600 feet away. And then, as David says in his own words, Then suddenly I saw him. Him seems to fit somehow, but don't ask me why. He had come up to the car while my back was turned, and he was standing near the open door. In the glare of the headlights, it was hard to see well, but he was short, probably not five feet in height. He had on a silvery one-piece outfit that looked like aluminized coveralls or a wetsuit. Moving out of the headlight beams and towards the car, I was about to say hi when my first good look stopped me dead. He didn't have a recognizable face. Now the being looked to him almost like a, quote, biological robot. And suddenly, David says, he felt this weird telepathic link to the being as volumes of information began to flow into his brain at a, quote, fantastic rate. As David says in his own words, it was like a data link between two computers. Ideas weren't expressed in words at all. There was just a stream of impressions. So according to David, the impressions were that this being was from a distant star in the Milky Way, a star which is normally only visible in the southern hemisphere. He doesn't talk about what else he got in terms of information, but he found himself walking with the being towards a craft. And he did say that he felt as though the E.T.'s purpose was to evaluate the people of Earth. But the next thing he knew, the humanoid instructed David to return to his car because it was too dangerous for David to be too close to the UFO as it took off. So David went to his car, and at this point he did see this strange craft hover briefly overhead before taking off in a burst of speed. Unfortunately, there is no more information on this fascinating case. Thanks to Timothy Green Beckley for bringing us that case, which, as unusual as it sounds, is not the only case where ETs have appeared on the radio or... You know, I know a few cases where people have seen strange images on televisions. I did a whole episode on cases where people believe they had telephone calls from ETs. So yeah, UFOs do have the ability to affect electromagnetic instruments in ways that you might find quite surprising. It's also interesting about that case is he had this big, what, quote, download of information. I wish we knew more about what exactly this witness learned from his encounter, uh, but certainly it is an interesting case. And now we move to another case, which is quite brief, but gosh, it's interesting. I like this case because it does involve a witness who is a police officer, so therefore a very careful and trained observer, and it occurred in a place where there is an enormous amount of UFO activity. I call this case, Why Do You Hate? 
And you'll see why I gave it that title in just a second. This occurred on November 1, 1980 in Lucky Point, Indiana. Quite a lot of activity in Indiana itself, but apparently this area, this particular area, is super active for reasons I shall talk about in just a second. But what an unusual case this one is. Now this case is quite brief, but really interesting, and it comes from MUFON researchers Francis Ridge and Jerry Sievers, very well-respected and experienced researchers. And also the main witness is quite credible, because as I said, he's a deputy sheriff. And it was around 9 p.m. on November 1st, 1980, and the sheriff was on routine patrol at Lucky Point in Indiana, an area locally known as the Lover's Lane. And as it turns out, also the location of quite a few UFO encounters. On this particular evening, the deputy had pulled over to stretch his legs and was standing next to his car looking over the top of the cruiser when he noticed a, quote, black triangle about 200 feet away and tilted at an angle. He estimates that this object was about 100 feet long on each side. He said it had large windows, and it was through one of these windows that he could see a row of five humanoid figures visible from the waist up. And they did not appear to be normal humans, because they each had a very large head, very thin neck, and very slim bodies. So the deputy watched in amazement, and this is when this case gets so interesting because he says he heard a very clear telepathic communication coming from the figures, and they asked him, quote, Why do you hate Iranians? And the deputy immediately thought to himself, I don't hate anybody. At this point, two of the ETs at either end of the row turned towards the center and faced the others. The object then quickly took off and was out of sight in seconds. So clearly this really impressed the police officer and per researcher Jerry Sievers, there had been nearly, get this, 100 UFO sightings at Lucky Point in the past 10 to 15 years. I suspect this is largely because this is sort of the lover's lane and there's a lot of people out there at night, late at night, and are in a perfect position to see UFO activity. Hard to say for sure, but this area definitely has a reputation for a lot of UFO activity. So wow, I mean, <laughs> there's a lot to learn from that case. Uh, this police officer saw this UFO very close up, these ETs. I'm assuming that's what they are. I don't know for sure. I do think the extraterrestrial explanation is the one that best fits the evidence. Uh, you can call them interdimensional or time travelers or whatever you want, but the fact is there are so many encounters. And just given the amount of stars out there and the fact that we ourselves exist on a planet, I think it's a fair assumption that there are other beings out there like us, and that's certainly what the evidence is showing us. Another very interesting thing about this case is the, how the ETs communicated, or what they communicated, to this police officer. Because often people do have communication with ETs. They express concern about wars and hate and div divisiveness and greed and corruption. So perhaps that's what they were inquiring about. And yeah, I suspect when they asked this gentleman, you know, about hate, that they were not questioning him in particular, but perhaps all of humanity. Of course, that's pure speculation. I honestly don't know. I wish there was more information in that case. But apparently, it's not an isolated one. Again, an area of pretty intense UFO activity. So, moving along to our last and final case in this little collection. I like this case because it does involve physical evidence, some pretty substantial physical evidence. Not super well confirmed, but it was investigated by a very experienced and well-known researcher. I call this one UFO in the Suburbs. This occurred on February 29, 2008, fairly recently, in the little town of Coogee, Australia.
So this is an interesting case for a number of reasons, as we shall see. This case was investigated by well-respected researcher Bill Chalker, and again, quite brief, but certainly very interesting, and it has, I think, some important aspects to it. It was around 4 a.m., very early hours of the morning, February 29, 2008, when the witness, a man who has requested anonymity, he was walking down a street in Coogee. This is a suburban area by the ocean in Sydney, Australia, when he was suddenly startled by a bright flash of light. And looking in the direction of the light, he saw a large spherical object, about the size of a large car, according to the illustration on the case. This object was actually now sitting on the ground at a T intersection. And even more interesting was that there was a window, or a sort of curved, transparent section, at the top section of the sphere. And looking down at him through the window was a little man. The witness became frightened at this point. He quickly hid himself behind an electrical signal box, but still watched this object, and he watched this little man inside this craft move what he believes was sort of a lever, at which point a shutter or a covering came down over the window area, rendering it opaque. The witness said he could also feel a strong heat being emitted from this object. The object at this point immediately took off upwards at a 45 degree angle. Now the witness estimates that he watched this for about five full minutes. Now the surface of the road in this area was coated with bitumen. This is a tar-like substance. And the witness, looking at where the object had landed, saw that the road surface had a sort of whitish circle on it, so clear landing traces. Also, the tree next to the object appeared to have been burned. And there's an even more interesting and, frankly, unfortunate end note to this case, because it was shortly after the incident that the local road maintenance crew actually repaved the area where the UFO had hovered, destroying the landing traces. Furthermore, a new electrical telegraph pole was placed at the intersection, and the wiring there was repaired, according to Bill Chalker. He tried to collect some leaves, but most of the landing trace evidence was completely covered up. And according to Bill Chalker, and I quote, the witness is a shy man of nervous disposition and seems unlikely to be the type that would make up a story of a UFO incident and does not appear to have much knowledge of the UFO subject. So a huge thanks to Bill Chalker for making us all aware of this case and doing a follow-up on it. Such a shame that the physical evidence was immediately destroyed after this case, but we do see that sort of thing in a number of cases where landing traces are paved over or buried or plowed over. That happened in the Westall UFO landing, which did leave landing traces right next to the Westall High School case in Melbourne, Australia. So perhaps this was an intentional act to cover up UFO evidence. Hard to say for sure, but it sure looks like it. And again, kudos to the witness for stepping forward and going public, because it wouldn't surprise me one bit if a lot of people saw this and no one's talking about it. It's a really interesting case. All right, that's it for today. I hope you've enjoyed this episode where we explored 10 cases of different humanoids, cases from all over the world, Cases going back to the 1950s all the way up to the 2000s. And cases where ETs behaved in ways that's just a little bit offbeat, a little unusual. And give all these interesting messages or communications. <laughs> still a lot to learn about this subject. There's still a lot of questions surrounding it. I think we are making tremendous progress recently. A lot of more people are accepting of this subject. It's gaining a lot of legitimacy that it hasn't had for decades. So that's great news. But there's, yeah, always more to learn. So thank you once again for watching. It's 
always truly appreciated. And until next time, keep asking those hard questions. Keep searching for the truth. It's out there. But most important of all, because I think that's why we're here, keep having fun. Till next time, guys. Thank you.